Hello and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Peter Lavelle. The candidacy of Ron Paul. What makes him tick? Why is he so popular among younger voters? Why do Republicans sneer at him while at the same time fear him? And does mainstream media fairly cover his campaign bid? To crosstalk the Republican candidate Ron Paul, I'm joined by Mark Williams in Sacramento. He is founder and former chairman of the Tea Party Express and radio host. In Washington, we have Mark Levine. He is a senior fellow with the Truman National Security Project and a talk radio host. And in New York, we have Michael Brendan Dowdry. He is a politics editor at Business Insider. All right, gentlemen, this is Crosstalk. That means you can jump in anytime you want. Last week, we did a program on, on Mitt Romney, and I got a ton of mail saying what, no one mentioned Ron Paul once. And I thought, maybe I'm doing the same thing that American media is doing to Ron Paul. So, Michael, first of all, explain to my international viewers, who is Ron Paul? What is he all about? And if there were an election on YouTube, why would he win? Well, Ron Paul is a libertarian influenced congressman from Texas. And he's uh, been in Congress twice as a Republican and still is a Republican from Texas. And he's run for the president three times, uh, once in 1988 as a libertarian candidate, again in uh, 2008 as a Republican and this year as well. And he is a very different sort of politician than the -the run-of-the-mill Republican. Uh, He's heavily focused on monetary policy uh, and our central bank, the Federal Reserve, and how it manipulates our monetary policy. And uh, he is also a peace candidate, uh, a kind of throwback to a very older Republicanism uh, that hasn't been around for a long time. I mean, it predates the Cold War in many ways. And uh, he is a very odd politician in that he doesn't do the normal horse trading that uh, politicians in Washington do, where they say, I'll vote for this if you send the money to my district, or I'll vote for this project to help out a friend or a donor. Uh, And that kind of pristine character is what drives the wild enthusiasm you see for him on the campaign trail. Okay, I think that's a very good summation. Mark in Sacramento, if I can go to you. But he's not going to win, okay? He has a very strong, strong following, but he's not going to win the nomination, but he stays in it. This is what irritates Republicans, doesn't it? It irritates Republicans greatly, and he's a walking example of why libertarianism doesn't work. It's, it's because of what Michael said. Ron Paul is a party of one. He has, he has no colleagues. He has no support. He has no infrastructure, political infrastructure. Uh, I've been interviewing Ron Paul for 30 years now, he, and he has been very consistent over all that time. Uh, he's a very literal interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, uh, but he's got a war worldview which is uh, utopian in that he believes that if we leave everybody else completely alone and uh, and subvert our own interests to theirs then they'll leave us alone which uh, obviously in this day and age doesn't work okay mark in washington you think that's a fair appraisal of what we just heard of uh, ron paul uh, pretty much. I, I, I used to work uh, with Congressman Ron Paul. I used to work in the United States Congress. And uh, Ron Paul was known as Dr. No because there was never a spending bill that he liked. He's against <laughs> all government spending. What is wrong as with much that? What is wrong with that? Okay, well, it's what's amazing. Wrong with that is, what's, you know, it, everything it, we've it, heard about Ron Paul in this program sounds attractive. I'm sorry. I'm not going to vote for uh, anybody in this election, okay? I don't vote. But, you know, everything we've heard here, what's wrong with Ron Paul then? Well, there are a number of things wrong with Ron, Ron Paul. First of all, a lot of Americans like government spending. The vast majority of Americans mm-hmm. like Social Security. They like okay. Medicare. They like their highways. They like their bridges. Uh, they like a lot of the things government provides, from libraries to schools to all the other things government does. And Ron Paul pretty consistently doesn't want any government to do anything. Uh, he also, by the way, is far out of step with Republicans on foreign policy. Uh, in fact, his foreign policy probably more closely approximates the Democrats, but it's even to the left of them. Ron 
Ron Paul does not want any military spending of any kind except to defend our shores. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, that, is, that is the main reason, by the way, why he cannot win a Republican nomination. On the other things, on issues of spending and lower taxes, he is very much a, a die-in-the-wall Republican. In fact, he's more seriously a Republican than the Republican Party, because the Republican Party, a lot of those people will support earmarks and other kinds of government spending. Ron Paul will be very attractive to them, but his isolationist school of foreign policy means that he can never win a Republican nomination. Michael, in New York, it seems to me that what we've just heard here is that Ron Paul makes the Republicans and the Democrats look almost identical, really, on most issues here, okay? It's, you're, we're looking at very little differences. Ron Paul comes out and well, says he, he a lot re- of different things that the Republicans would say, even the Democrats. Well, he really does. And I want to jump on something said before about Ron Paul's utopianism. Actually, in America, we've had a lot of utopianism in the past decade. Suddenly, two wars were going to democratize the entire Middle East. Uh, This kind of Wilsonian fervor that somehow the force of arms will change a culture of a region in just a few years when the culture has been there for 1,400 years. In that way, Ron Paul is very anti-utopian and much more of a realist. Uh, Mm -hmm. People just say it's an isolationist stance. Well, maybe it is. But it's also one that is as skeptical of government uh, using force of arms abroad as it is about using the force of um, its welfare programs or social spending here in the United States. In that way, and that's the argument Paul has been making to young people and to uh, a lot of people that feel alienated from the two parties, just as you said. Okay, Mark, get back in Sacramento. Uh, Peter, I I I was going to go to you anyway. Go ahead, jump in. Yeah, if I might interject here, uh, Ron Paul's true value as a candidate is in focusing the discussion and focusing all the debate in the, the very direction Michael's talking about, toward getting Americans to start thinking about what this country is and what it should be and what it was intended to be as opposed to what it's become. Uh, and in that, he's very valuable because he's, he's so far to the right and to the left, depending on the issue, that he drags the discussion in both of those directions. And it's a, it's a very good thing to be sitting here and talking about whether or not we should intervene around the world, particularly when we have a sitting president who thinks that the military is his own private toy to invade every, anybody he, he decides to invade in any given day. Uh, we, we need that kind of discussion in this country to be a check and balance on our government. And, and that's, that's what's out of balance in America right now. The government has, has, has turned into something it was never intended to be. The people fear the government. The government doesn't fear the people as it should. Okay, Mark in Washington, what do you think Peter, about... I, I, because it, it seems to me, I mean, if you like Ron Paul or not, I, disagree, I agree with Mark said in Sacramento. He's shaking up things because America needs to be shaken up, and its foreign policy is just in tatters. It's a disaster for the United States and its own security, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not mimicking Ron Paul. That's my opinion. Go ahead. Well, I, first of all, I want to correct you when you say that sort of Ron Paul puts the Democrats and Republicans together on one side and him standing apart. To understand Ron Paul, to understand libertarianism, I think you have to look at both economic freedom and social freedom. I would argue as a liberal Democrat that the Democrats support economic and social freedom. Economic freedom would be equal opportunity, the chance for every American to have a chance to succeed. And that would include things like health care and education and other things that give uh, poor people a chance to succeed in life. Republicans are very much against that kind of economic opportunity. When it comes to social freedom, you find whoa, that Democrats whoa, support, whoa, for example, whoa, whoa, well, let, let, me finish my, let me finish the my Demo- analogy. Demo- let me finish my analogy. Me. Uh, Mark, because, the because, Democrat because, because Party hey, is not in freedom, favor of economic freedom. Of course it is. Economic social opportunity. Freedom, not let, economic me finish, freedom. let me finish my analogy. Absolutely not. <laughs> when it comes to social freedom. How much freedom, economic freedom do I have when 50% of what I earn is confiscated by the government and redistributed by the government? No, the Democrats I'm aren't for economic, economic freedom. freedom is equal They're for opportunity. mentioning how I spend my money, what I spend it on. The Democrats have just, uh, just mandated I must buy health insurance. Okay. That's right, because Democrats believe that every American has a right to live, and you shouldn't die in the richest country on earth merely because you're poor. Republicans say, and, and, and Ron Paul would agree here, that, uh, listen, if you can't afford health care, just die, get out of the way. And let, I mean, Ron Paul opposes, by the way, allowing emergency rooms to care for poor people. But I want to finish my distinction, just real quick, because in social freedom, when it comes to civil rights, when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, whether you can smoke a drug, whatever it is, Democrats support individual 
individual freedoms. They say, you know, legalize marijuana or uh, allow gay people to get married. And Ron Paul stands on their side with regard to social freedoms. But Republicans are against those. But he stands with Republicans when it comes to economics. He's opposed to equal opportunity. Okay. He says, as you just said, keep all your tax money for yourself and let the poor fend for themselves. Okay, Wait. Michael, if I could go to New York here. Let me come on, guys. Is so rabid we, we, about social. We have we have Michael in New York here. Michael, yeah, I, I, yeah. I was watching you listening to both of them. Okay, and I kind of see a little bit of Ron Paul in you, thinking, "There they go again." Am I wrong? <laughs> Well, no. I mean, I, first I want to correct a slur here that Ron Paul just wants people to die in the street. Um, that goes quite against his career as a physician where he didn't accept Medicare or Medicaid. He would treat patients for free or accept whatever they could give him, and he would give them health care. And that's what happens in a free society. People cooperate with each other rather than assuming that the government is going to take care of everyone, when in fact sometimes the government can't take care of everyone, where there's a bureaucratic snafu or there's no money or there has to be rationing. Ron Paul actually provided for people himself. Uh, and that's another reason why people are attracted to him. And I would say this, that you know, economic policy as, as a matter of freedom, Ron Paul would say, we need to be free to have our own currency if we want it, or we need to be free to have a dollar that has a solid value and it isn't constantly manipulated. Uh, and he believes that if you followed a, a policy of sound money, things would get cheaper over time, like gas, instead of constantly getting more expensive as the dollar itself loses its value. And frankly, I think the, we should return to the discussion on foreign policy, because oh, we will. nothing oh, has, we will. is bankrupting America faster, making it more insecure than its foreign policy right now. Okay, Mark and Secretary. But, but we should be clear that right, just because Mark in Washington, Ron go Paul, ahead. Mark in yeah, Washington, I, I, go I, I, ahead. I, I have Mark to address. Mark in Washington, go just, ahead first. Go ahead. Real quick, just, we should be clear that just because Ron Paul, as a doctor, as a physician, did provide for patients, he does not believe that doctors across America should do so mandated by the government. He believes that if a poor person doesn't have money to afford a doctor and can't find a doctor to treat him, that poor person is out of luck. All right, gentlemen, we're going to go to a short break. It's a very spirited debate. We're going to go to a short break, and after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Ron Paul's campaign. Stay with our team. With the end of the Cold War and the going away of the Soviet Union, many people thought that nuclear weapons disappeared. The risk is not zero that something might be going off by mistake, especially when there are thousands of nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert. The purpose of the weapon is to use it either as a threat or as an actual weapon. You know, if you keep spending a trillion dollars a year on weapons, eventually you're going to blow everybody up. You, you know, people are dying from these weapons, but until we actually see it, people don't, don't wake up to it. Nuclear weapons are built to be used. That represents all the firepower of the Second World War. And this second sound is the equivalent firepower of the world's nuclear arsenal today. Fewer chances, but full of life. Limited time, but more optimistic. The theater where the ingenious open their heart to the rest of us. What are the real limits? Love Syndrome on RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're talking about Ron Paul's popularity among voters.
All right, gentlemen, I'd like to talk about two issues in this part of the program, how Ron Paul is changing the political debate, and I think foreign policy we haven't really finished with here. I think it's very important. Mark, if I can go to you, what's wrong with what, what Ron Paul says about the United States? These two, these two wars that are very, very expensive, they're lost, America's reputation is in tatters, and the country is going bankrupt. I mean, what's wrong with his foreign policy saying, don't do that anymore, okay? It seems like common sense to me. Market no, Washington market wrong, Sacramento with, first. With what he's saying. Oh. Yeah, there, there's nothing wrong with that in, in the context of Afghanistan and Iraq. Those, those have been screwed up royally. Uh, and, and we should have been out of both a very long time ago. Uh, in, in terms of, in just generally speaking, uh, the reason why we have intervention around the world is because we have interests around the world. Even our founding fathers wrote into the Constitution a standing navy to keep the sea lanes open. So we have legitimate interests, economic and military, around the world. What we've done here is go off the rails and try to impose our will militarily on other countries that that really we shouldn't be doing. I mean, Afghanistan is a great example. There's no point to being there. The whole point of going there was to get Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Yeah, but Mark, the if, Mark, if I could jump in here, but if, 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 I could, now? if I could jump in, but if we'd listened to Ron Paul, as the political elite had listened to Ron Paul, we never win it, it would have gone into those wars. That's my point here. He's been consistent and for we would, four, we almost 40 have, years. We wouldn't have gone into Go other areas where we were needed either. Okay, well, we, we I don't see we where interventions work to America's advantage or the people on the ground. Mark in Washington, what do you think about that? I mean, is, is, is Ron Paul making people think about American foreign policy? Because it seems to me that's what people are most attracted to, is these, these very expensive lost wars, and the learning curve is flat. I don't know. He seems to get his biggest booze in the Republican debates when he talks about foreign policy. People like him in the Republican field when he talks about cutting spending or cutting taxes. But when he talks about foreign policy specifically, one of the things he said recently was that the United States should not have gone in to kill Osama bin Laden. That's an extremely unpopular position. I got to give Ron Paul credit. He's got integrity. He's consistent. He never supports any wars or any military action unless under the Constitution of the United States, there's a declaration of war according to Congress that's in the Constitution. But his, his views on this are way out of the mainstream of the well, Republican Mark, Party. Mark in Washington, what's wrong with the American government adhering to the American Constitution? What's wrong with that? I think that... No, I think the American government should adhere to the American Constitution. I really do. I, I think, though, that Ron Paul takes the constitutional fetish a bit too far and finds further restrictions in the Constitution that aren't there. I mean, he ignores clauses like providing for the general welfare and other clauses that Congress has used for generations. Uh, of course, Congress has had military actions as opposed from war for, for 200 years. So I just think it's clear that his views on this are out of step with most of the American people. Okay, Michael, what do you think about that? Maybe he's out of step, but maybe he's leading. Well, he, he's, it's both, actually. He is out of step, and he is leading. Um, Washington, it's not just a matter of one constitutional interpretation here or there. I mean, the American political class has a culture. It's shaped by our elite universities. It's shaped by uh, American history. And our American elite in both parties, believes that they can manage every human endeavor. They can manage how companies pay for health insurance. They can manage how things are run in Baghdad and Kabul. Uh, they literally believe that their education, that their values entitle them to dictate terms to everyone on every subject that they deem important. Ron Paul is the one out there arguing, no, we don't. People should run their own lives, nations should run their own affairs, and we shouldn't involve ourselves in them. So I think it's even more than just a constitutional battle. I mean, this is a cultural battle. And we've seen the results in Kabul and in Baghdad. We're seeing the results in Egypt and in Libya that the United States can't just control every single uh, human endeavor on the planet. We don't have the power. We don't have the knowledge. Uh, we don't even have the moral fiber. I mean, you see presidents can't even manage to produce a budget that makes any sense in this country, and yet they want to talk about even traffic laws in Baghdad. The whole idea is absurd, and Ron Paul has called people out, and that's why he is leading. And this campaign has been a huge exercise in building a movement within the Republican Party uh, that follows these ideas of personal freedom, of peace, and liberty. Okay, Mark, in Washington... And Mark in Sacramento, you both were nodding your head there. Mark in Washington, let me go to you first here. I mean, you guys agree with his, uh, Ron Paul's positions, but then when I ask you about, you know, when we're listening to Michael, then you, I go to you and say, but, 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 and but. I mean, it, it, sometimes it is kind of simple, isn't it? Go ahead, Mark in Washington. 
Well, I agree with Ron Paul's positions on personal freedom. I agree that the drug war goes too far. I believe that we should protect American civil liberties. I think we should be worried about uh, government excess in terms of uh, earmarks in Congress and so forth. Uh, so I very much agree with the personal freedoms argument. And uh, the Republican Party, in fact, is against both Democrats and liberals with regard to personal freedoms. They want to regulate a woman's body and, and decide who should get married, things like that. But when it comes to economic freedom, uh, which oh, I know Michael doesn't that. like that term, I'll, I'll just call it economic opportunity. When it comes for the, the ability of every American to achieve the American dream, to grow up poor and become president of the United States, to have health care and education and, and, and food and shelter, the basics of living in the richest country on earth, their Democrats are on one side and Ron Paul and the Republicans are on the other side because Democrats believe that every American should have a chance to succeed. And it shouldn't just be that if you're rich, you get to succeed just because you're rich. So I agree with Ron Paul on personal freedom. I disagree with him on economics. OK, Mark in Sacramento, look like you're going to burst there. Go uh, ahead. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Mark, Mark is delusional. It's liberal Democrats who have outlawed same-sex marriage in California. It's liberal Democrats who refuse to what? legalize liberal marijuana Democrats? in California. It's liberal they Democrats. They want to legalize marriage. It's a liberal Democrat uh, uh, state. The Republican marijuana. Party is barely an idea here. And, and there's, there's, <laughs> there's like a half a dozen Republicans in the entire state. <laughs> and and it, it's the Democrat Party that wants to confiscate the money that anybody earns beyond whatever the Democrats think they should earn. What, what, what Ron Paul signifies here is, is actually very much the Tea Party message in that the government has gone beyond its bounds. We, we have a, a war going on in this country right now, a civil war going on in this country between the people who should be running the government and the elites who think they're better than the rest of us and who are running the government. They don't want to let go of it. These old fossils, these old dusty old white guys are going to sit there until they die or fossilize. They, they think that they are in charge. The Democrat Party and the like Republican them, Party out. elites no believe that they should run every aspect of all of our lives. Okay, Michael in New York, if I can go to and you. they also believe they are, should run every aspect of the lives of the rest of the world. Okay, Michael, if I can go to you, how is Ron Paul changing the political discourse in the United States? How is he changing it when we talk about uh, conservatism, liberalism, even libertarianism? I mean, is this campaign a defining moment or, or a moment or a beginning of a, a defining moment in how Americans talk about politics? I think it's the beginning of a defining moment. I mean, our political discourse is controlled by the media, by uh, large-scale institutions, think tanks, by direct mail groups operating in suburban Virginia. And Ron Paul, for the first time, is really building an infrastructure to disseminate his ideas in the long term. I mean, on this campaign, he's going out there state to state, finding out who are the people that are sympathetic to his ideas, whether they're Republicans, whether they're independent, whether they're Libertarian Party people, identifying them, putting them on a mailing list, sending them literature about the Campaign for Liberty, these other organizations that they're building, or um, college organizations that they're building, and, and really trying to institutionalize these ideas in this movement so that they last even beyond his own political career. And maybe some of these mailing lists are going to be used by his son in a future run. I mean, they've seen the power of using a presidential run to build up a movement. Uh, and that's extremely important in taking these ideas out of the air and putting them directly into our politics. Uh, so he's been a, a tremendous success doing that. Mark in Sacramento, what do you think about that? I mean, he, Mark, um, I'm sorry, Ron Paul certainly is not going to be elected president of the United States, but what will his legacy be in this election? Is he changing the way people are thinking about politics, particularly young people? At the risk of, of people around the world not understanding the metaphor, he's a Johnny Appleseed of political ideas. He's, he's running around planting these ideas that will later sprout. I mean, I, I have... Uh, I adopted some pretty libertarian views myself 30 years ago when I first started arguing with him about politics. Uh, he's very much educating Americans, especially young ones, about the process and getting them involved. And in that, he's absolutely invaluable. He is, uh, as I said, he, he's taking the discussion to a new level here, and one that's needed. Um, uh, Mark in Washington, I think that's a very good uh, uh, observation that Mark in Sacramento made, is because at least people are getting active, people are getting involved in the process again. It's good to see young people wanting to get involved in the process because you can you can have the occupy wall street movement and you can uh, vote okay so i mean it's a nice mixture isn't it 
I think Ron Paul represents a very loud, very passionate minority of Americans that don't fit neatly into Republican or Democratic camps. And I don't think Ron, Party, uh, Ron Paul, frankly, belongs in the Republican Party, nor the Democratic Party, because when you hear him talk, you'll find half the time Republicans cheer, half the time Democrats cheer, or maybe I should say a third, a third, because a third of the time people just scratch their heads and say, what? Uh, he brings up monetary policy. No candidate ever brings up monetary policy. He believes in the gold standard, which is a throwback to 100 years ago. Neither party supports that. So he has some ideas from one party, some from the other, and some that are frankly his own. He does represent a third force in American politics. I think the libertarian force will always be smaller than the Republican or the Democratic force, but I'm glad he's out there. And I'll tell you one thing about Ron Paul. The man has integrity. He doesn't change his views to fit uh, the wind the way Mitt Romney might do. This man believes in what he says. I think some of it is wildly off the wall, but I give the guy credit for being consistent. Michael, what do you think about that in third force? We just heard that from Mark in Washington. Is this Again, the beginning of something, because we have seen third-party attempts in the past, you know, and uh, because of the way the system is built now, it's almost impossible for something new to arise. Maybe Ron Paul is the answer to that. Well, it's tough. I mean, the Republican Party itself was once a third party in American politics, and the galvanizing issue of slavery made it into not only a major party, but the ruling party during the Civil War. I mean, it could take something, you know, a, a major financial crisis again or something else to make these ideas even more relevant. I think Mark in Washington is right, though, that this is a minority view right now and that also Ron Paul's collecting people who maybe didn't have libertarian views but who are just sick of the system as it is. They don't feel it's working okay, for them. Okay, sick of the system as it is. We're going to finish on that note, gentlemen. Thank you very much. We've run out of time. Many thanks to my guests today in Washington, Sacramento, and in New York. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time. And remember, Crosstalk Rules. Thank <laughs> you.